Hi, welcome to our session of uh, Dance and Disability, Building Artistry, Engagement and Inclusion for Students with Disabilities. I'm Deborah Karp. I'm going to be leading you through this today. Um, I am a licensed K-12 dance educator here in the Twin Cities, and um, I am excited to work with you today. I have been focusing, um, the, I would say for the past seven years, a lot of my dance teaching has really been focused on teaching students with um, disabilities, both in sheltered classes and in um, classes in which students are mainstreamed general ed and special ed together. So um, just a note before we get started, I wish that we could be in the room together experiencing this uh, all together live in the same place. Um, and if we did, the session would look a little different. Uh, there would be space to um, actually feel each other dancing together. There would be dialogue together. I would take pauses so we could ask questions and share out ideas um, and help uh, some of the session might, those questions might help kind of steer other parts of the session. But uh, we're in a different time. So um, thanks for joining me in this uh, virtual format. I'm going to be toggling between um, my face <laughs> speaking to you, pausing the video so we can um, set up and actually move and do some dancing together and also sharing the screen with you for some slides that I've made. So thank you in advance for your flexibility and your patience with that. So um, I think we should get started. Um, I am going to share the screen now. I'm going to share with you a kind of a list of events for our session together for this next little while. I call it a presentation score. So let's get that shared screen uh, going on. Here we go. All right. So um, first in our session today, I'd like to address uh, the systemic racism in public education and um, focusing specifically on the topics of overrepresentation of black and brown students in the special education system, trauma, and uh, how that affects the nervous system and what we um, can know and do with that in our work as dance teachers. Next, we'll move on to a section I call examining our practice, looking at uh, how we define dance, looking at the norms that we hold in our classroom for ourselves and our students, and looking at our goals and expectations for ourselves and our curriculum and our pedagogy and our goals and expectations that we have for our students. Next, I'll move on to a section that I call tips and strategies, some um, very concrete and specific ideas that I have developed in my teaching and that I've gathered from other dance teachers uh, working with students with special needs, and I'll share those with you. Uh, from there, we'll move on to a part of the presentation I call curricular notions. And this means um, I'm going to share out some specific curriculum ideas and experiences that I've had that have felt um, rich and successful to me in working with students and dis with disabilities in order to build creativity, engagement, and full inclusion in the dance classroom. I'd like to take a moment after that to address the importance of partnerships within our uh, roles as dance teachers for students with special needs. And then after that, we're going to just take, I'll lead you through a moment uh, to reflect on the information and the dancing that we've done together. And um, I'll end with a resource slide to help close us out, some resources that we can look to. Cool. So let me close this out and um, uh, I'll go on to share another screen, another slide with you as well. Um, here we go. Oh, let's just skip that. All right. Um, let's close this out. Sorry for that. Uh, before we get started, um, just a few notes on materials that you'll want to have handy for the session. So we're gonna, I'm going to ask you to be doing some reflective writing or drawing as you wish. So please have handy um, uh, writing or drawing utensil paper that you can jot down on doing some free writing. And um, we will be dancing a bit together. 
if you choose. Uh, so I suggest as we are as in our comfortable clothes and the space that you have to dance in in your home or whatever space you're in right now is fine. It's perfect. It's enough. And I also want to just um, offer the reminder that we that we know, but maybe sometimes we forget that uh, you are in charge of your own experience. If there's a moment that you need to pause and the recording is keeping going, please take a moment for yourself. If there's something that doesn't feel right to you and you need to uh, rework it, please uh, find a way to do that because this experience really is for you. So um, I'm going to be addressing all of us and addressing this just as not um, the, the end all, the expert voice, but really as a kind of jumping off place, a living document, as you, if you will, to share my experiences in teaching dance for students with special needs, uh, things that I've gathered and learned throughout my time, lessons that um, I've gathered from other folks. And I hope that this can be the um, starting point for a conversation between myself and you all so we can go forward in our um, elevating the, the field of dance, uh, particularly for inclusion for students with uh, disabilities. Cool. So now I really am going to share a slide. Um, and we'll go here. Great. And let's share my screen with you. Great. So um, in this, in this uh, very particular moment with uh, the murder of George Floyd uh, at the hands of a white police officer here in the Twin Cities and um, the, the protests and all of that uh, has resulted as a, um, from, that, from that moment, uh, we're living it, it's fresh in our minds. Uh, it's had a worldwide ripple effect um, now more than ever, although um, it's been happening in the history of public school, I really want to address uh, the systemic racism that is happening in public education grounded in how that affects our um, students of color in special education. So we know that without a doubt there is representation, over-representation of black and brown students in the special education system. And as dance teachers, we can be agents of change to help uh, reconfigure that and help stop it. Um, I also want to consider that um, students are students of color who are living in high needs areas where there might be violence, community violence within the neighborhood, in addition to experiencing the trauma of racism within their public education system might be uh, entering the dance class with trauma they have experienced in their own lives. So our charge as dance educators is to be able to work with that for through a trauma-informed approach and to be sensitive uh, to that as well as their special needs that they're bringing in with us. So um, trauma studies have shown that uh, creativity and play in particular playful games where we can um, move uh, and address and calm the nervous system have helped um, bring a sense of, of calm for students who have experienced that trauma and help, um, help them as a way to deal with it. Uh, as dance educators, I think we are, uh, we are really poised to consider where that lives in the nervous system and how we can move through that. I'm sure that you have a lot of uh, experience and ideas and wonderful things to bring to the table. So I wish again that we are in a room sharing that because I want to hear your ideas and I'd like to hear some of the ways you address that. Um, from here, I would like to take a moment to look at the place of um, uh, just, it's just a brief idea of how trauma lives in the nervous system and how it has somatic roots within our bodies so that we repeat those somatic patterns uh, if there's not awareness of them or if there's not um, if there's not a pathway to move out of them and for that I look to Bonnie Bainbridge Cohen founder of uh, body mind centering as a place to look at um, uh, somatic uh, cellular conscious approach of how um, trauma is coded within the nervous system. So you'll see at the bottom of this screen, there's a YouTube link to one of Bonnie's videos. It's about three minutes long. 
Um, I'm going to request that you pause this recording right now and click on the link and take a look at that. And then when you're done, let's join back together. All right. So you can pause it now. Hi, welcome back. I hope that uh, you had that something to take away from that video of Bonnie teaching. Uh, some further questions, some things that were inspiring, some things that didn't sit right even, and you want to um, ask them a little bit more. Uh, I'd, I'd like to move on to the section that I call examining our practice. So um, these are questions that I have found useful to ask myself in my own teaching that have continued to keep me sharp and elevated my dance teaching. Uh, and it's a personal thing. I'm just gonna ask you to reflect on your own teaching and your own values. And uh, I can say for me, I've had to ask myself these questions over the years and the answers have changed. They haven't been static. And so again, let's consider this as um, a living, breathing moment that will shift. All right, so I'm gonna attempt another screen share and we'll discuss it as we go. Great examining our practice. So um, how do we define dance? How do you define dance as, uh, your, as your own artist self, as your dance educator self? How is dance defined by your students? How is it defined in your classroom? Is it simply the body moving um, through space in time with energy? Is it meaning making in action? Is it dance as a cultural expression? Uh, is it movement aware of itself? So these are all definitions that I have um, taken from teachers of mine and uh, experiences of mine throughout my, throughout my life dancing and teaching. Consider, when you think about a dancer, what do you have in your mind? What's the image? So let's go for the first response. Try not to edit here. Is it a person who has full capacity of all four limbs? Is the person dancing with an assistive device? Are they in a wheelchair? Do they have consistent eye focus? What is the race of the dancer that you have in your mind? What language do you imagine they speak? What are they costumed in? What are they wearing? Where are they dancing? So consider where does the dance take place? Let's move on to the next question we see on our screen, norms, expectations, and goals. So what are the norms that we have set up for our dance classroom? Is it required that all students come in in a neat line and form um, lines across the space or a circle? Are we okay with um, uh, vocal expression as students enter? Does it have to look a certain way? Do we change our ideas depending on the needs of the students or uh, do we request and require the same thing of all students across the board? Where are the students in class? If there are lines, who's in the front? Who's in the back line? Where do we place ourselves in class? Are we looking at the mirror? Are we facing the students? Are we standing with them in the circle? Do we mostly stay in one place? Do we move through the space as we teach? What are our expectations for students when we're teaching? If we have a, a class, a sheltered class of all students with special needs, and there are 15 of them, is it okay with us as teachers that when we give a language prompt or we show a movement prompt or choreography, that we have 15 different interpretations of what we've just done? Do we need students to really, um, follow the prompt we've given and replicate as much as possible, as exactly as possible, the phrase and the movements that we've just demonstrated. Do we expect all students to be dancing at all times? Are we comfortable with a student who sits out for five, 10 minutes, who walks around the classroom in circles for five or 10 minutes, who uh, safely and uh, while kind of checking in with us, takes time entering and exiting the classroom as forms of self-regulation during the dance class. Is this okay with us? Are we meeting our goals with the students if this is happening? 
are the students meeting their own goals while they're uh, while they're doing this what are our goals for our students is it everybody's dancing 100 percent is it everybody's achieving the same thing at the same time um, what do we expect of our students what's our what's our bottom line what do we feel at the end of a lesson at the end of a unit uh, semester or year that the students must have developed and achieved in order to feel that um, they have fulfilled what we have uh, what we've designed in our dance curricula they have fulfilled their own growth in our dance class they have met some of the um, dance growth um, targets on their IEPs so there is no right answer to these questions. Again, this is, this is just a time to reflect and really consider what, we, what our ideas are and what our values are before we're even entering the dance classroom. And finally, uh, something that is really the most important for me in my practice is, are we keeping the bar high? So no matter how mild or severe the needs are for our students with disabilities, are we maintaining the highest bar of artistic integrity in our dance education practice for all students no matter what their needs are and no matter um, how how we have to teach to an individual and an individual are we keeping the bar high all right i'm going to move back to the main screen cool all right from here uh, i'd like to move on to the next section and I'm going to attempt to share with you a different slide and we'll keep talking through it. Again, if this is a moment where you feel like you need to pause uh, and do anything for yourself or take a screen break, I understand that, feel free to do so and we are going to keep moving on. All right, so for our tips and strategies section, uh, as a bridge before we go on to that, I'd like to share a story with you, a personal um, teaching story. Uh, a, a few years ago, I uh, was teaching a class of students uh, who were between kindergarten and uh, second grade, and it was a sheltered class of students with disabilities that ranged from, <clears throat> from moderate to severe disabilities. Uh, and I had a student in that class that I'll call Student L. And um, Student L was um, a memorable student for me came in the dance class was always happy to be there eager to be there had a lot of questions about what we were doing uh, entered the class pretty happily and was always ready to come in and sit down in the dance circle very participatory um, sometimes was easily distracted by peers but was able to really refocus in the dance class pretty quickly as a dancer um, student l had a a beautiful propensity towards smooth and sustained movement and was just a joy to watch in some of these um, in some of the uh, moments of class where it was really open for sustained and smooth movement. So um, this was a challenging class for me. I think about it often and uh, I, made, I made very specific notes before and after each class. I spent a lot of time planning each class. I really considered and reflected after each class what worked, where the needs were, where I need to retool my um, curriculum for the following week. And almost every single class ended up being emergent curriculum, right? Because there was so much happening in the class and it was more useful for me to address what was happening instead of just like going forward with, um, something that I had planned outside of class. So in that way, we really developed it together. Um, so student L, um, I found, uh, student L was in this, was part of this class and did have uh, antagonistic relationships with some of his peers, but I was always able to reorient him back into dance class. Now, a few weeks into, um, into the year, his teacher told me, disclosed to me, that he wore a diaper. Um, and that in addition to his um, learning needs in class, he experienced severe trauma as a very young child. And so um, as part of his, some of his, as part of his goals and uh, as part of his IEP targets, he had a toileting goal that they were working on throughout the year. So I bring this to you today because what does this have to do with my dance teaching? 
So the question for me was, um, oh, I should tell you also that in all of our classes, uh, each class, no matter how different the, um, the curriculum ended up looking from class to class to meet the needs of the students, we always started, uh, at the, it was the same warm up. we always started in and we always followed that with a dance freeze game in which I prompted the students to do different locomotors and asked them to freeze in various shapes uh, modified with uh, space elements such as um, high and low, open and closed, et cetera, and different um, shape variations. So this was, a, this was a part of the curriculum. So the, the question for me after learning this piece of information about the student was, is it realistic for me as a dance teacher to expect this student to be able to stop and control his locomotion and his movement through space if one of the things that he was still working on was basic bodily function? So I offer you that as um, a little bridge between our brief discussion about expectations and moving into the next sections of uh, tips and strategies and also um, some curricular ideas. So I'm gonna share a screen with you again. Here I go. So considering uh, concrete tips and, tips and strategies for uh, teaching dance to students with disabilities, whether it be in your studio program, uh, in a in a school setting or an, um, some other kind of community setting. The foundational thing that I want to um, share with you is this notion of movement translation. My body might not do what your body will do, but I can fulfill the requests and the needs of this dance education still. And I can interpret it in my body in my own way to make sense for me. Here's an example. Um, take a gallop through space, right? So we know that a gallop is a rhythmic movement and um, We might say that in a gallop the back leg chases the front leg Okay, let's go to the foundations of that. Let's go to what the sense of uh, the rhythmic movement uh, Try galloping in your shoulders. Try it out with me As dance educators as dancers, we all know the rhythm of our own gallop through space Try it um, Let's try a gallop, translating it to another part of our body, trying it with our eyes. Trying it just with your arms, seated perhaps, trying it with your arms. Trying it seated or standing as you wish and try um, just rocking on your sits bones with the gallop, with that rhythmic sense of the gallop. Fantastic. Okay, let's say a jump. So a jump is, let's go underneath what a, a jump really is. Two feet go up, two feet go down. But what's underneath even that? Two sides of the body go up, two sides of the body go down. We're working, uh, the body's working together homolaterally. So try jumping with your arms. Jump, jump with your shoulders. Jump, jump with your head. Jump, jump with another part of your body. Jump, jump. Typically a jump will leave the ground. But what if students are not going to leave the ground? How are we going to translate what we ask students to do? Let's say uh, we're asking students, it's um, maybe the beginning of a choreography unit, and we're asking students to create their own phrases with a jump and a turn and a rise and a drop. Okay, I'm just going to give myself a little bit more space. Try it standing if you wish. Try it seated if you wish. Or try it um, axially in your place. So here we go. Let's say we go jump, turn, rise, drop. Try it in a different way. If you were seated the whole time, um, try moving up and down. If you were standing the whole time, try it on a different level or a different plane. Perhaps try it with a different body part. If you did it only with your arms, try it just with your legs. It's up to you. We're translating the basis of the movement, the foundations of what we know the movement is as dance educators, to other parts of our body. All right, I'll call it out. Try it on your own time. Ready, set, here we go. And jump, and turn, and rise, and drop. Beautiful. Pause here. If you want to try it in a, a different way, I'm going to go on. Um, 
translation can even happen, I think, across all genres of dance and across all requests of dance. So um, even if uh, perhaps you're working with a, a ballet unit and one of your students uh, uses a wheelchair, um, consider how you can work with the student to still fulfill the articulation of what we usually think of as the feet in a tendu. Um, what happens, what's the energy and the swing and the specific location in space of a bat ma? Um, those are the things that I, those are the pieces that we work on when we work on movement translation. Even if it's not the same body part, we're still um, fulfilling the, the, high, the, highest, the highest bar of dance education when we consider where the part of the body is in space and how much effort and weight we need to use to execute the movement. All right. The next point I have on the slide you'll see is your location in space. If you have a student or students who um, use uh, assistive hearing devices or a hard of hearing and they're relying on um, seeing your face in order to read your lips, consider where you are in space. I had a, a classroom teacher tell me once before I started um, the dance class with his students, my student will not be able to know what you're saying or see you if you're more than two feet away from him. So I had, to, um, I had to be very conscious and really consider where I was in the space in order to create the, um, the, full, the most fully inclusive environment for the student. Was my back to other students? Was I gonna be looking? If I was looking at the whiteboard where I'd written down with both drawings and words and images what the prompts were that we were gonna do, if I'm reading it, uh, looking up at it, then the student was going to miss what I was uh, saying with my face. Okay, so they, it seems like something um, basic and that's inherent to us as dance teachers, but consider where you are in space so every student can really fully benefit from your voice and from your body and uh, what you're showing to the rest of the class. Using assistive devices. Um, I know uh, many public school districts request, require, and offer <clears throat> microphones for their teachers. I highly suggest using this, particularly if you have students who, um, who will be left out because they cannot hear your voice and if you're, giving, if you're working with verbal prompts. If they're left out because they can't hear your voice and if for some reason they're in the back of the dance studio, whether because that's uh, where they've placed themselves or that's where you've placed them, Consider what their engagement level will be and how much they're going to be learning if um, some of their main senses have been removed because we're not able to uh, provide all of the ways that they can be successful. The next bullet point I have is considering the amount of language that you use. I learned this, um, I learned this while teaching and I, I will never forget, this was, um, this was a major point of, uh, of learning for me and I'm grateful for it. I was teaching a sheltered class of uh, students with um, moderate to severe disabilities. And there were, um, I think for about 12 students, there were four paras in the class in addition to the classroom teacher. We were doing a, um, a, what we called a dance inclusion class where we um, had the, that class of students with special needs and a class of students at their same grade level who were in the general education program uh, dancing together. To, uh, it was called Dance Inclusion uh, Project to build empathy, to reduce bullying that had been taking place, and to dance and be creative together. The students come in and we're getting in our big circle to start, and I say to one of my, uh, one of my students, um, excuse me, can you please step back in the circle so there's space for everybody to stand? The para looks at me really close to my face and says, too much language. She looks at the student. She has her face close to the student, looks him directly in the eyes and says, step back. And then he knew what to do and he did it. It was a lesson for me because I thought I was being um, respectful of the student. I felt like I was explaining why I was giving him the direction I was giving. Um, I was setting him up for success so he could understand where everybody was going to be in space. But I didn't understand his, uh, his needs within his processing disorder. And so I put him at a disadvantage initially. 
because it was too much language. So for, uh, particularly for students with processing disorders, consider the amount of language that you're giving them. And if it just goes into their ears and becomes a jumble in their brain, they're not gonna fulfill the artistry that they um, have the potential for in our dance classes. They might not feel included because they can't process the information that other students are processing, right? Um, and that also goes to the bullet point that I have just above, pardon me, which is wait before repeating yourself. For our students with processing needs and processing disorders, if we give them a prompt and then immediately say it again, it becomes a jumble of language in their brain that they are constantly trying to redo. So for example, if I say, um, make a big, wide open, sharp shape. Make a big, wide open, sharp shape. Great, make a big, wide open, sharp shape. Every time I repeat the directions, the student will start from the beginning again to process my directions. And they'll never be able to process them because I keep interrupting their, um, their hearing and their putting together of the words. So wait, give a pause, and um, let them take in the information and the, the spoken vocabulary that you're given before you go on to ask, do you understand? Do you have any questions or repeating the prompt itself? And finally, I wanna end this section saying that um, simple does not mean unsophisticated. So we might have to uh, give less language or shift the way we demonstrate or the way we um, offer movement phrases and sequences and uh, dance movement. But that doesn't mean it's unsophisticated. How can we scaffold all the information that we are giving in a way that is digestible so our students with special needs can still take it in, can hear it, and can participate in it? All right. So now we're going to move on to um, my favorite portion of our session today, the curricular notions uh, portion. This is my favorite because we're actually going to dance and we're going to put some of these, um, these pieces of information and all the discussion points into action as much as we can in this uh, virtual digital format and um, in our own spaces. So uh, one, I want to share uh, something that has been really key to me and foundational in my teaching for students with disabilities that I've had um, a lot of success with. I'm going to share a screen with you. All right. I imagine a lot of you are already familiar with this, Anne Green Gilbert's Brain Dance. If you're a bit unfamiliar, here is um, a kind of pictograph screen chart of uh, each of the stages. So the brain dance moves through the stages of neurological development that the fetus goes through in utero and also that the baby goes through from about zero to um, uh, one, more or less, you know, there's a little space in there. But um, you, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna stop talking for just a second so you can take a moment to read the chart of the brain dance. Uh, and this is free and open, open source information. If you Google brain dance and if you go to Anne Green Gilbert's uh, website, she's based in Seattle. There's a lot of information there. You don't have to pay. Um, it's, it's open source for everybody. She does uh, lead workshops and there are opportunities to study with her, which is super cool. Um, and the idea in the neurological patterns is that all of us, no matter where our development is or has been, that all of us at some point skipped a stage or need to go back through the stages to repattern. And the way that we would do that is by um, not going, let's say we uh, kind of skipped as a, as a baby or um, young child the body side, where we draw one line, we move one side of the body, articulate that, and then we articulate and move the other side of the body. Let's say we skip that. We wouldn't start there. We wouldn't start with um, 
going over body side, we'd go to the pattern before, the upper lower pattern where we um, articulate everything from the belly button and above and then the belly button and below separately. And in that way, um, with a lot of work, the, we can uh, build back and repattern some of those places that we might have uh, skipped through uh, in our development. So why brain dance with students with disabilities? Uh, breath self-regulation, articulating, um, articulating some of the main developmental places such as upper, lower, and body side. Cross-lateral is key and also vestibular. So I'll spend just a moment talking about this. In some of the um, sheltered uh, SPED classes that I have worked with, the teachers have danced alongside their students. And for some teachers who are, have danced a lot with their students over the course of years and have become familiar with the brain dance. The teachers bring it into their classrooms. They do it as a daily practice. Maybe they do some stages, maybe they don't do all the stages. One teacher I worked with for about six years said that um, she, would, she was um, a teacher for students with special needs in grades four and five. And she said that she would use the brain dance particularly for when the students had to sit and take standardized tests. She felt that they were um, able to focus better afterwards, that they were more refreshed and uh, their bodies felt calmer and they seemed more confident when they were about to take the tests. Seems pretty basic for us as dance teachers, but um, I think that if we can incorporate it into our practice and we can spread the word, amazing. Let's look at cross-lateral. So cross-lateral, we know that one side of the brain um, dictates the actions of the opposite side of the body. It's always really uh, telling for me when we do cross lateral and I might do something like uh, one elbow touches the opposite knee to see which students are struggling with that and which students need that repatterning. And there's, uh, we do cross lateral in a million different ways, crossing from one side to another. Depending on the capacity, the movement capacity of the student, it doesn't have to be the full capacity of arm and leg. It can even be something like a hug. It can be um, reaching to the opposite shoulder, or crossing the arms, making twisted shapes that go high, that go low, that open, close, that curl and uncurl, as long as we come back to that twisted shape. I'd like to offer you a story. Um, um, previous to being here in Minnesota, I taught with Luna Dance Institute, based in Berkeley, California, in the Bay Area, uh, for six years. And one of our partner teachers was um, a teacher for students, uh, kindergarten and first grade with special needs. She did the brain dance, she participated in dance class for many years and did the brain dance in, in our dance classes and with her students. And tells the story of a student who um, was struggling to write the letter W. The student would take his pencil in one hand and do this. And instead of continuing to do the W, her student did this, transfer the pencil, and then do it with the opposite hand. And he was that way for quite a while in her class. Until finally one day he was able to continue going across the page to write the whole W. And she attributed that to a lot of the um, cross lateral work that was done throughout his dance class, that he was finally able to cross his midline. Um, a few, more than a few years ago at a conference, um, an NDEO conference in Chicago, um, I took a session, maybe some of you were there, with Susie Tortora, a dance therapist and educator Susie Tortora. And she talked about um, the, the increase of diagnoses in her clients that she was seeing uh, the increase of ADD and ADHD diagnoses in her clients that she has seen over these many years. And she attributed it to a lack of vestibular stimulation. That because there are more screens in the presence of our students' lives and because we are more indoors now um, than we have been in the past, uh, depending on the neighborhood of some of our students, the outdoors might not be the safest place. The park may or may not be the safest place. She attributes the diagnosis to a lack of ability to do things like roll down hills, to go on um, the, um, 
the the carousels at the playground, the things that spin around, the seesaws that go up and down, and all of those things really, really stimulate our vestibular system that kids do naturally in their play, but um, with that are that have separated a little bit in our um, society and in our ideas of what safe play looks like, and in the increase of um, sitting and learning minutes for children in their classroom. So uh, I would. I would sincerely and uh, deeply encourage you to use the brain dance as part of your warm up or your full warm up in your dance classes to really be able to reach all of those developmental stages. And the brain dance doesn't have to look any certain way. It can be as uh, creative or it can be as genre specific in your dance classes as you wish to make it. All right, so let's go from here. Um, all right, so I'm going to lead you. Um, I'm going to lead you through some lesson ideas that have been uh, important and key for me in my teaching. So let's consider uh, when we're teaching. Let's consider working with movement qualities. So as dance teachers, we know that the element of time can be grounding for students, and in particular, the concepts of beat and rhythm. In my teaching uh, with students with processing and cognitive disabilities that range from uh, mild all the way to severe, I found that rhythmic word phrases to teach qualities of movements have uh, yielded results that demonstrate incredible student creativity and exploration and also very deep and clear understanding of the concepts. And this understanding carries over one week to the next. So we're gonna try it out ourselves. Here's the movement portion. You can stay where you are. You can kind of uh, move into a different position as you're comfortable. If you wanna clear some of the, um, the furniture, anything around you, I encourage you to get up and, uh, or rise or seat as you will and participate. All right, so let's say we're working with the movement qualities smooth and sharp. I might use the movement phrase smooth, 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 sharp, sharp, sharp. Let's try it this time just with our arms. Here we go. Smooth, 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 sharp, sharp, sharp. Beautiful. Let's try it just with our shoulders. Smooth, 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 sharp, sharp, sharp. Let's try it thinking of the patterns of the brain dance. Let's try it just with our upper body. So with the kids, what I do is I say, I take out my magic dance marker with the younger kids and I draw a line right in the middle, right? We might try smooth, 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 sharp, sharp, sharp. Let's add some other um, concepts on there. Let's try some um, vertical plane concepts, some axial movement, some space element, right? So we might try it rising and falling. We might try it axially, smooth, 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 sharp, sharp, sharp. We might try it in our place. We can also try it locomoting through the room. Try it turning the whole time. Smooth, 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 sharp, 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 right? We can try it opening and closing. Smooth, 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 sharp, sharp, sharp. Each time I say it and each time we try it, I am really cognizant of using the words rhythmically. So the students can hear the words within the rhythm of my speaking. They can feel it rhythmically in their body. Typically when I teach this, I also play a drum. So the drum is another reminder, a kind of oral and musical reminder of the rhythm and the accent and the movement quality of each word. It, I found that it's really important for cueing the words and their quality with it. Once I see the students um, have it embodied, I might say to them, or once I think they're on the precipice of that, I often say, shall I keep saying the words or do you want me to drop the words out? Depending on their personality and where they are and their understanding, they might say, no, 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 don't say the words anymore. And they try it out themselves. So whether our goal is student-centered choreography or uh, whether we're just pre-teaching qualities so students can apply them to steps in choreography that we're about to teach them in a, a later unit, we can ground them in rhythm to develop a sense of repetition and understanding within, um, within the curriculum. Um, I'd like to share another story 
About five years ago, when I was a teaching artist with Luna Dance Institute, I taught a sheltered group of students with emotional and behavioral disorders. We danced in their classroom once a week. And although we would push the chairs and the desks aside, our dance space was small. It was much smaller than a studio and it was a lot smaller compared to um, the stage space that they had or a typical gym, um, auditorium or cafeteria space. Frustration and explosive behavior were very common with this group of young people. One of our most successful lessons focused on, again, opposite movement qualities also paired with time. We used counts and elastic time. So we worked with the qualities tight and loose. And um, the enduring understanding of this lesson was that muscle tone and pacing are tools for both physical and emotional self-regulation. So let's uh, try it together. I'm gonna stand up and um, scoot my chair back and feel free to do it standing seated as you're comfortable. If you wanna pause and uh, do it in a different way, that sounds good. So I'm gonna ask you to squeeze your muscles as tight as you can. So squeeze your muscles as tight as you can, make them as tight, and now loosen your muscles as tight as you can. Try it again in a different way. Squeeze your muscles and make your muscles loose. Beautiful. Let's add some counts to that. I want you to take four counts to go from totally loose to totally tight. And then again, we're going to take four counts to go from totally tight to totally loose. In real life, if I'm teaching, I demonstrate it and I would also count it with a drum. Here we go. One, two, three, four. Get loose. Four, three, two, one. Try it again in a different way. One, two, three, four. Get loose. Four, three, two, one. All right, let's stretch out our counts. We're gonna take eight counts this time to go from totally loose to tight. One is totally loose. By the time we get to eight, our bodies are as tight as possible, squeezing our muscles. And then we're gonna get loose again. All right, going from as tight as we can to loose, 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 like a loose spaghetti. Ready, set, here we go, one, two, Three, squeezing, four, getting tight, five, six, seven, get tight, tight as time, eight, we're gonna release, we have one, two, three, four, getting loose, five, six, seven, eight. Awesome, let's uh, layer on the concepts of curl and uncurl. So we're gonna curl in and opening out, curling in and opening out. I often use curl and uncurl. You can also consider expanding and contracting, opening or closing. Uh, also considering the vertical plane, you could even do rise or fall. Let's do curl and uncurl. Uh, we'll stick with eight. Ready, set, here we go. We have one, two, three, four. Try it with me, five, six, seven, eight. Get loose, uncurl, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Let's try it in one. Can we get our bodies as tight and as loose as possible in only one count? Ready, here you go. One, 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 one. All right, fantastic. Thank you for joining me. I'm gonna find my seat again. So as I said, the main focus of this lesson and in, uh, with this particular group of young people was self-regulation. As we went deeper into the lesson, I added modifiers that the students were already familiar with, such as locomoting through space, expanding and contracting, as I mentioned earlier, traveling toward and away from a partner, alternating which body parts got tight and loose. So these not only addressed my standards of choreography and learning, but they also deepen their choreographic toolbox while we were doing it. Specifically, I noted that the students were calmer and more focused and more willing to try new ideas than they had been at the beginning of class. 
All right, I'd like to move on. I'm gonna share a screen with you again and discuss the idea of um, props within a dance classroom for students with special needs. So thanks for dancing with me. Thanks for hanging with me while I get my screen happening. Okay, cool. So um, I highly encourage the use of props, particularly for students um, with special needs who are younger. I found them incredibly useful throughout the elementary school years um, and almost vital for my students who are third grade and under. But of course we know that props of any age can um, kind of open up a new sense of artistry and artistic exploration for students of all ages. So I wanna talk about the use of scarves. Uh, we're dance teachers, we know scarves, we love scarves, we hate scarves, we worked with them a million times. Um, when I'm trying to teach a certain movement quality, such as light or floating, um, it can be abstract for, it can be abstract in the body. And if students don't already have an experience, uh, a tactile experience with something light and floating, it's very difficult to put in the body. I think scarves are a beautiful demonstration of that. They can become an extension of the body as well. If we're asking students to do duet work, perhaps using a scarf might be easier for students who have trouble relating to each other than just doing um, starting with a mirroring or shadowing exercise. If we use the scarf to mirror, if we use the scarf to copy and shadow, um, we can relate more easily to our peers than if we have to actually stand and look in their eyes and copy their movements. There's something about that that is a little less intimidating um, and allows for a student to um, kind of project the ideas onto an object rather than onto another person or take those in. So I would use that. On that same note, for my very young students, when we are talking about something like uh, movement qualities like heavy and light, bringing in uh, tactile objects are incredibly important. Something light like a balloon or a feather, something heavy like a brick or um, uh, I. I think I used a heavy weight one time, heavy-ish weight that was in the PE room that I was able to borrow to feel that difference in uh, heaviness and lightness. Hula hoops have been um, an interesting prop for me as well. I had um, a group of students combining, a group of uh, K through three students combining with a group of K through three students who were in the general education track and um, students with special needs in a sheltered special education room. We wanted them, them to form relationships with their grade level peers. They didn't mix, they rarely mixed on the playground and they were nervous with each other. We placed hula hoops throughout the room and we prompted them to do a galloping movement towards a hula hoop and make a big shape in the hula hoop. Jump out of the hula hoop, make a big shape with one arm down in the hula hoop and the rest of the body extended out of the hula hoop. Find a small shape in the hula hoop do a leap out of the hula hoop, do a high and low dance going around the hula hoop. So whether we're working um, relationally as, uh, as partners um, or as trios and quartets with a hula hoop, or whether we want to teach, um, especially the young children, the properties of, um, of space going um, over, going up, low, high, low, around and through, uh, hula hoops are a really fantastic prop to use that. Um, Anne Green Gilbert, uh, you might have her book, has a fantastic lesson called the Chopstick Lesson that teaches, is a wonderful kind of introduction for weight. And it's a beautiful lesson in partnership. Uh, two partners have to balance a chopstick between them without losing it. And she takes us through all of these steps about balancing it with your non-dominant hand, balancing it with different body parts, trying to find a way to go over and under with your partner. Um, I feel that it's a gorgeous lesson and I've taught it with uh, students with disabilities and seen creativity and relationships that had not surfaced otherwise. And finally, Gertie Balls. So Gertie Balls is the actually official name. Maybe you've seen them. There are these kind of rubbery balls that are about this big. Uh, some, of, some of my dance colleagues also call them squishy balls and you can blow them up so they're really um, topped and blown up or you can loosen them a little bit so there's a little space. 
these are fantastic props if you want to teach weight and also if you want to teach uh, partnering or contact improv with some of your students to build that sense before they do any partnering or weight sharing. They can have the ball between them. Mm -hmm. So you might try balancing a girdie ball but, uh, with your back to a partner and seeing if you can roll it or if you can turn around, uh, if you can move through the space, if you can walk through the space, if you can change levels, if you can open and close through the space without dropping that girdie ball. It gives that beautiful sense of weight, how much you need to, um, uh, how much you need to find the contact with your partner and where you need to back off a little bit with the ball. And again, it's one of those props where for our students who, um, who are nervous about relating to their peers because of some of their abilities um, or because they are not somebody, because of some of their emotional challenges, this is kind of that intermediary. This is kind of that place in between where they can really find what a duet relationship looks like in a low stakes way. All right, let me close out of the screen. So um, I'll take just a brief moment again to address, as I said in the beginning, to address the notion of partnerships. I'm sure as teachers, you have all formed partnerships um, with so many people, so many of the stakeholders that you work with. If you're in a studio, perhaps it's the parents of the studio, other students and families. If you're a teacher in school, I'm sure you have like a huge web of partnerships within your school, from the administration to the other teachers, to students, even those who are not in your class and the families of your students. One of my primary important partnerships has been with a pair of professionals that I've worked with. They know students the best. They spend the most time with the students. They know their personalities. They know where we can challenge them and they know where we need the extra um, scaffolding and time to take that. I also wanna acknowledge the systemic racism that happens um, in education within the role of the paraprofessionals. Often the lead teacher um, has more education and has more, um, uh, has a greater sense of who they are and responsibility within the class, uh, or at least it looks like that. And the, the paraprofessionals are often um, adults of color working with students who are not paid as well as the teachers in the class and are not offered the same professional development opportunity here. So, um, but they are our key players. They are the, um, some of the most important people that we can work with and interact with and also um, learn from when we're working with our students with disabilities. I would advise um, taking time out to make those relationships with the paraprofessionals, take time to discuss each student, what do they learn, um, what's happening, what do they observe happening in the classroom and what new things have they noticed their students doing in your dance classroom. This is also a chance for to us as dance educators to explain our values and maybe um, uh, break down what is happening in the dance classroom. For example, in my dance classroom, when I give the prompt to run or roll on the floor, that's what I, that's what I want the students to do, and that's okay. It's not okay in some uh, contexts and schools that I worked in that students will start running in their classroom. For some teachers and paraprofessionals, they have, uh, it's not okay or considered appropriate behavior for students to begin rolling on the floor in their classroom. But in dance class, it is. And I get the chance, I, um, I, take, the, I take the time out and the opportunity to have a dialogue and explain why that is. We know that running is one of the main locomotors in dance. We um, find it happening in different levels and with different energy qualities. Rolling is a way to um, ground the nervous system and to find the edges of our bodies, uh, where our bodies begin and end in relation to our environment. Some students with uh, special needs really crave that sense of compression. Again, it's another vestibular movement to stimulate the vestibular system and calm our bodies down before we go into dance class. Another, um, other uh, partnerships that I've had great success with are the classroom teachers. So if we teach in a um, secondary, if we teach in middle or high school, they're having a million different classroom teachers, or uh, teachers beyond your classroom. Invite them into the dance class. Uh, with elementary school teachers, they have their primary teacher. Invite them into the dance class. Ask them what they saw their students doing. 
uh, in my experience of teaching almost to a T, every time that a classroom teacher participates in dance class with their students, or even drops in for um, three or five minutes to see what's happening, their faces light up. Um, they, in my conversations with them later, they reveal that they see their student in new ways. Wow, we never knew, knew he could move like that. Wow, he's such a leader in class. He's, very, he's such a leader in your dance class. In class, he never raises his hand or says anything. I think this is an opportunity for us to um, really share what's happening in the dance classroom so students can be elevated in their capacity, both in their classroom and among their other students. And of course, we know that this is dance advocacy. This is showing what dance education is capable of and what our students are capable of and why it needs to have a consistent place at the table within our public education. All right, I'd like to share with you a slide of resources. So I'm gonna pause and pull up my slide. Okay. All right, here we are, our list of resources. So this is, um, as I said at the beginning, this is not an ending point. This is definitely not um, a totally conclusive list of resources, but uh, a beginning. And I hope that you'll keep in touch with me and that you'll add to this so we can have a much, much longer list of resources for um, best addressing dance education at the highest level for our students with special needs. So um, all of these are hyperlinks. The first one is Access Dance Company, uh, an all ability integrated dance company based in Oakland, California. Um, if you click this link, it'll bring you to their resources page. They uh, have a tremendous amount of resources for dance educators and dance teaching. Um, and I highly suggest that you visit, uh, visit their website um, to, for resources for yourself. And in addition, um, there's so many um, performances and performance clips that you can find on their website and on YouTube to show your students. So that when we are showing dance to our students, um, we are really showing them inclusive dance and bodies of all abilities. The next resource is called BodyWise uh, Dance Inclusive Dance Classes. This is a colleague of mine, Margot Greenlee, who has um, uh, BodyWise Dance working with, um, she works with adults with um, cognitive and developmental disabilities and leads inclusive dance classes for, um, for all ages. So this link will bring you to those classes and um, she is, uh, she's a master at what she does. She's also a dance educator herself and um, participating in the classes is a joy and there's so many things that we do have to learn from her. VSA Kennedy Center, perhaps you're familiar with this, um, gives a list of resources for inclusive arts and inclusive dance. If you visit their website, they're also a treasure trove. Luna Dance Institute, if you, um, go to this specific link on Luna, it can, um, it'll bring you to the ways in which Luna works with um, students of all needs, uh, programming that Luna does. There's a lot of articles that uh, founder um, Patricia Reedy has written um, about lessons learned working with schools and school districts, teaching students with special needs. And um, Luna also does as part of their professional learning program. Once a year, Luna hosts an annual um, kind of roundtable discussion and panel about uh, inclusive dance, um, featuring some of the um, strongest voices on inclusive dance. So there's a lot to learn from there. And finally, uh, Jess Curtis Gravity Access Services, uh, also located in the Bay Area. Jess Curtis Gravity is a choreographer dance company who um, does audio transcription of performances for those who are um, blind and have um, low sight visual impairments. Um, this is visiting, if you visit this link, there's fantastic resources about how to be inclusive when um, looking at performance for students who um, are sight impaired. And I encourage you to scroll through this because it is, um, brings you to even more resources and links that you might um, choose to incorporate, whether it's um, Kind of education or performance focused. All right, so um, I'm going to ask you to pause the video now, get out your writing and drawing materials, and take a moment to reflect. I'm going to ask you to jot down, draw, or dance out um, questions that have come up for you, issues where that you'd like to follow up with, um, things that 
even things that maybe didn't sit right with you that you would like to um, go back and have a dialogue about. Further questions that you might have or um, some inspiration that maybe came through the way. So take a moment to pause the video and then we can come back. All right, I'm glad you took the time. Uh, it's time to close out. We've come to the end of our session. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I really hope that you were able to have some meaningful takeaways from this or um, just add some ideas to your teaching practice. I love dialogue. I love talking about dance education. I really love talking about dance education for students with special needs. So um, I request, I humbly request that you reach out and keep in touch with me. Uh, feel free to email me some of the questions or um, anything that came up for you. Once again, I'm going to share our final slide with my um, contact information. There it is. So um, please do keep in touch. You can see my email is right there. Um, and as, our, our, as we close out, I just want to encourage you to, um, to really keep the bar high for artistic integrity for students of all needs. That's the best way that we can keep uh, moving forward in dance education. And I think that as dance educators, that's the best thing that we can do to partner with our students. Thank you so much. Take care. <laughs>